they move like soldiers, Corvus thought, as he watched the ex-prisoners spreading out across the Ferro Creek. A few years ago, they had been gangsters and philosophers, thieves and agitators. Now they were his army, well-drilled and highly motivated. He knew much of the credit was his, but in turn, he knew he owed a lot to whoever had given him the gifts he possessed. People listened to him without doubt, and he had an innate understanding of fighting. To direct an attack or devise a strategy came as naturally as breathing to Corvus. Some of the men were pointing upwards and shouting. A craft appeared beyond the field barrier, twin trails of plasma bright against the dark sky. As it descended through the barrier high above, Corvus saw that it was shaped like a great mechanical bird of prey, golden in color, with angled wings that stretched back like those of a diving hawk. It hovered a moment, and plasma engines dimmed as the pilots switched to anti-gravitic impellers to land the craft. Falling slowly, the shuttle came to rest at the center of the apron, within the inner circle marked there in red paint. Corvus looked in the canopy and was surprised to see that the cockpit was empty. He suddenly felt a hint of suspicion at a seemingly unmanned craft. Perhaps it was loaded with explosives, a desperate act of petty revenge from one of the guildmasters. Ready weapons, Gaffion called out. The men raised an assortment of slug throwers, shotguns, and las rifles looted from dead guards and captured weapon lockers. A door opened in the side of the shuttle beneath the right wing, directly opposite Corvus. Light spilled from within as a gangplank extended from the craft with a clang. A shadow appeared in the light, waiting for a moment at the entryway before emerging into view. Whispers spread through the men, of surprise and amazement. Guns quivered in shaking hands, and there were clatters as some of the soldiers dropped their weapons. Seemingly without prompt, the men lowered themselves to the ground, putting aside their weapons and bowing their heads. Some prostrated themselves, whispering fervently. Corvus glanced to Gaffion beside him. The lieutenant was on his knees, too. There were tears in his eyes, and an expression of joy etched on his slack-lipped face. So majestic, Gaffion muttered. What glory, what power. Confused, Corvus directed his attention to the man descending the landing ramp. He seemed unremarkable. In fact, he seemed so unremarkable that Corvus couldn't discern a single distinguishing feature about him. He was of average height, with dark hair and moderately tanned skin. In build, he was neither bulky nor slight, but of normal proportion, slightly larger than the malnourished men who now abased themselves before him. He was dressed in a robe of white linen, free of ornamentation except for a necklace of gold on which hung a pendant fashioned in the shape of an eagle, with outspread wings and a lightning bolt in its claws. The man's eyes were as indistinct as the rest of him, neither blue, nor green, nor grey, nor brown, but a flecked mixture of all. Yet there was something in those eyes that reached into Corvus and touched upon his inner self. There was kindness and wisdom there, and antiquity that was very humbling but also disconcerting. And at the same time as Corvus saw this, he also witnessed the arrival of a demigod, wreathed in golden light and dressed in white finery that burned with its own light. He saw a stern face set with two golden orbs for eyes, piercing in their intensity, searing into the core of his being. The stranger seemed to tower over the kneeling men, borne upon a carpet of undulating flames. It was impossible to reconcile the two images. The supreme, grandiose king of men approached Corvus, but all the while the slight, unimposing man flickered within. Finally, Corvus's mind could fight no longer against the glamour, and he saw the new arrival as his followers did, and was filled by an overwhelming urge to pay obeisance to this stranger. He fought that instinct. He waged a war that his people would not bow before another man. The newcomer's effect on Corvus's men unsettled the rebel leader. He stared with narrowed eyes, unable to discern which image was true and which was the illusion, as the stranger paced slowly and confidently across the ferrocrate. Who are you? Corvus demanded. What have you done to my men? 
The stranger looked around at the guerrilla fighters regarding him with adoration, seeming to Corvus slightly nonplussed at the scene. His blonde hair fell in waves across his shoulders as he turned his head, spilling like fiery liquid. Another wave of majesty swept over Corvus, and again the guerrilla commander had to make a physical effort not to fall to his knees. An occupational hazard, said the man, returning his attention to Corvus. He fixed the rebel leader with a stare, his eyes now permanently golden like bottomless wells of light. There was a glow of power beneath his skin, as if the stranger's flesh were embers masked behind thin paper. Corvus experienced a momentary fluttering in his breast and a knot of anxiety in his gut, a fraction of the effect the man was having on his warriors. I am the emperor of mankind. I created you. Hearing those words was like a veil lifting from Corvus's eyes. He saw the emperor as he had seen him before, watching the growing infant through the canopy of an incubator. His face had been distorted by curved plates of glass, but the features were unmistakable. The guerrilla leader long pondered the face from the earliest memories, wondering to whom it belonged. Now, vague recollection became sharp memory. Corvus recalled the noise and lights and booming voices which had engulfed him, remembered a surge of power and disorientation as unnatural forces had borne him away from his place of creation. Now he saw and knew for certain the face of his father, the only individual worthy of Corvus's unwavering obedience. He lowered himself to one knee in deference, understanding that the stranger spoke the truth. Here was the master of mankind. What do you call this place? The emperor asked. It used to be called Lycaeus, Corvus replied. Now we know it as Deliverance. A good name, said the emperor. Please, rise, my son. We have much to talk about. And they did. Corvus withdrew from his men and took the emperor to his quarters, an old guard station in the mid-levels of the Black Tower. Corvus sought food and drink for his guest ashamed at the meager fare he could offer his father. The emperor waved away the concerns, sitting on the rough bunk serving as a chair for the massive rebel commander. Do you recognize me? The emperor asked. His expression was hard to read, but Corvus thought he detected a hint of surprise behind the question. Whatever glamour had befallen the guerrillas had a lesser effect on Corvus, and the man before him was definitely the same one as from the old memories. As if from a dream, he replied. Interesting, said the emperor, with a smile and a nod. They spoke about many things, though Corvus was bursting with questions about the emperor, about himself and the wider galaxy, he found that he did most of the talking, answering queries from the emperor concerning what had taken place on Deliverance and Kiavar. Corvus furnished him with all the information he could concerning the history of the star system and the war for freedom he waged over the recent years. Corvus paced the room as he spoke, animated and energized. The emperor sat on the bunk and nodded occasionally in understanding rather than approval. In fact, he showed no judgment of any kind, no condemnation or endorsement of Corvus's actions. He listened intently to all that Corvus told him, sometimes asking exceptionally pertinent questions about the tiniest of details, wishing to absorb all about Corvus's life. But there is one piece missing that I cannot answer, Corvus said, finally voicing what his heart had yearned to know since his first discovery. How is it that I came to be here? The Emperor's mood darkened, and his face grew grim. For the first time, he took a sip from the glass of water Corvus offered him hours earlier. There is another universe, he said. It lies alongside ours, part of it, but also separated. It is called the Warp. I know of it, said Corvus. Though I have not seen it, I hear that ships can use it to travel to distant stars. Some of the machines of Kievar are set to harness the energy of the warp. It is a universe of boundless power, and it can be accessed, as you say, 
by ships, and by minds of special men that we call cycles. The Emperor continued, Like our galaxy, the warp is inhabited by creatures not of the flesh, but of thought. Sometimes they hunger for our material lives, wishing to feast on our mortality. You and your brothers were taken from me by denizens of the warp before you were ready. Brothers? Corvus was excited by this prospect, pushing aside the questions that the Emperor's answer had prompted. Though he had made many friends among the prisoners of Lycaeus, always Corvus had been aware of his otherness. And when they started calling him Savior, any hope of any normal relationships had ended. That there were others like him filled Corvus with hope again. Yes, you have brothers, said the Emperor, smiling at his son's delight. Seventeen of them. You are the Primarchs, my finest creations. Seventeen? Corvus asked in confusion. I remember that I was number nineteen. How can that be? The Emperor's expression grew bleak filled with deep sorrow. He looked away as he replied. The other two, he said. That is a conversation for another day. Where are my brothers now? Are they with you? You and the other Primarchs were snatched from me by strange powers of the warp, thrown across the galaxy on unnatural tides. That is how you came to rest beneath a glacier on this moon. Yes, I have seen what befell you, learning your life the moment I laid eyes upon you. The rumor of you, of a magnificent being who led a rebellion here, has traveled farther than you think, and it was the word of this that attracted my attention. Your brothers, those I have found, were similarly scattered to far-flung worlds. Like you, they are all great warriors and leaders. That was my gift to you. You are supreme commanders with intellect and physical ability unmatched by anything in the mass of humanity. I engineered you from my own genetic structure to be my sons and my lieutenants in the Great Crusade. What is this crusade? How many of my brothers have you found? Most of them, replied the Emperor. I have vast armies, the Legionus Astartes. As you are crafted from me, so they are crafted from you. The Primarchs are the generals of those armies, leading humanity's reconquest of the galaxy. The long night, the age of strife, has ended. The remnants of the old empires smolder out in the darkness. The dying coals of humanity almost smothered by the dark. The Great Crusade fans the flames into life, bringing with it reason to drive out superstition. Enlightenment to replace barbarism. With your help, I will unite humanity and lead mankind to rule the stars. It was so much to take it in, but Corvus knew it was the truth. Not only the words of the Emperor seemed certain, the idea of what he described meshed with a much deeper feeling. Knowing he was a Primarch, that he had been created to fight and to command, explained much that Corvus had never understood about himself on a level that he understood in his spirit and was encoded into every cell of his body, Corvus now knew what he was. I swear my loyalty to you, said Corvus, sinking to one knee in front of the Emperor. He met the Emperor's gaze and felt elation like no victory had given him before. I am your son, your Primarch, and your will shall be my command. That is good, said the Emperor. I have an army waiting for you. They are the Raven Guard, highly decorated and distinguished in my campaigns already. When you are prepared, you will assume command of the Legion. Am I not ready now? Corvus said, having been elevated and then deflated by the Emperor's words. Not yet, my son, said the Emperor. But soon you will emerge to join your brothers and take your place at my side, at the head of the Raven Guard. First, though, tell me about Kiavar. What are your intentions? To bring peace to both the world and its moon, and to heal the wounds of the past, said Corvus. With your help, I will succeed. 
Peace is the hardest of goals to achieve, my son, said the emperor. Victory, the cessation of war, the demilitarization of our opponents, those we can obtain with might of arms and perseverance. But peace, that is an altogether different beast. Corvus frowned, but nodded slowly. The emperor sipped from his glass, gaze unmoving. Tell me again, then. Tell me of the wounds you and your followers inflicted upon this world, and of the peace you would bring to it with my help. 